pleasure to introduce Vera Tiesler, who is this quarter a tinker visiting professor at the University of Chicago. And some students in this very room are having the extraordinary good fortune to be taking the class with her called The Human Body, Body Modifications, and Social Identities in Ancient Mesoamerica. Vera joins us from the Universidad Autónoma de Yucatán, where she's a research professor and one of the foremost bioarchaeologists in ancient Mesoamerica. Her numerous publications address questions of cranial modification, burial practices, human sacrifice, and other critical questions for understanding the Mesoamerican past. Key books, among many, include Smoke Flames in the Human Body in Mesoamerican Ritual Practice, which is the Proceedings of a Dunbar Noakes Symposium co edited with Andrew Shearer, The Thorough and Multidisciplinary Reexamination of the Foundational Met Mayan Tomb in Hanapakal of Palenque. Reconstructing the Life and Death of a Maya Ruler, co edited with Andrea Cucina, and a number of works on cranial modification, including Head Transformations in Native America in the Andes, Identity, Power, and Embodiment, co edited with our own Nene Lozada. Very recently received a Honan Seat Grant to study the archaeology of the senses in a product in project entitled Understanding the Sensorial Experiences of Ancient and Modern Maya. New Archaeometric Studies of the Organic Compounds and food, of Food and Fragrances. And there are more books on bioarchaeology and dental modification in the works. Vera Tiesler received her BA in Art History from Tulane University, her MA in Archaeology from the Escuela Nacional de Antropología y Historia, and her PhD in Anthropology from the Universidad Nacional de Antropología. We're so grateful to have her here with us, have her here with us this quarter, and today, to hear about precious smiles, permanent dental modifications among the ancient Maya. Welcome, Vera. Thank you, Claudia. Well, um, I'm all thankful in general um, to my hosts of the class of the Anthro Department here at the University of Chicago. I'm extremely honored and delighted to be serving as a Tinker Visiting Scholar here and um, will be part of the mission and vision of the Foundation and of the University of Ch Chicago in, in general. Uh, thanks go to Natalie Arsenault, to Mario Flores, to Claudia Brittner, my host, of course. And it really feels like home already, maybe except for despite of the 60 degrees Fahrenheit difference from, from my hometown in, in Merida, where we teach. Um, this has been really uh, scholarly heaven, I must say, the library holdings, uh, meetings, um, perspective work in the field museum here. Um, the um, University of Chicago gave me the full freedom to choose the topic I wish to, and what better topic to engage when now entering the second week of the seminary course in body modifications. So I'm really thrilled. As Claudia already said, this has been a bumpy start uh, for everyone on both sides. Um, we are trying to get back to normal in the bioart lab in Yucatan too. Uh, we just had our year meeting in the Conocet province, which includes our colleagues here from the University of Chicago. And uh, an unforgettable tour was our kickoff here. My son uh, and I enjoyed by Claudia and through the campus. Thank you so very much. So, this talk um, was thought of as the second segment of a combo talk of two talks, which I started last year when it didn't kind of work out. But now that we're kind of gearing back to normal, um, this is um, I'm happy to provide an in-presence talk on, on this second part. The first one was on head chipping, and there were many, many open questions which I tried to 
uh, solve and add other questions from the perspective on dandy crafting among the ancient Maya and beyond. Um, I will. Uh, I will. So, yeah. I will talk about the uh, many lunatic meetings, the multifarious, ritualized uh, daily crafts and the social identities that are attached to this, and then go beyond in a colophon past the Maya collapse that we before um, basically ubiquitous um, practice, practiced by over half of Maya adults during the first millennium, kind of dropped in uh, diversity in techniques and also in practice, going back uh, to the pristine forms of embodiment uh, during the pre-classic that the Maya had during the pre-classic. Uh, first of all, um, well, for, before starting a disclaimer, because um, given the nature of the topic of this talk, there will be um, photographs of ancient human remains, um, just in case there is some sensitivity here. Um, I also must say that in the case of teeth, there is a peculiar quality about them, um, given the hard um, matter of enamel, and uh, given that this is the only segment of the human body that is not covered by soft tissue, we can basically um, plug them into mouth uh, which is for the poster uh, with help from our project artist and then see how the smiles were well more over a thousand years ago like look into the mouths of the ancient maya so that's why i tell the precious smiles um but first a visit to our dentist's waiting room this is going to be a toothy topic so we need to have the basics right here uh, we're talking about the mouth as made up by the maxillar bone and the jaw, the lower jaw. And typically what the ancient Maya targeted in their dental reductions, dental permanent dental modifications were the anterior teeth, the pairs of central lateral incisors, the canines, sometimes the premolars, mostly the upper dentition, but also the lower one often. And this is typically like um, in, in hidden behind your lips, so it comes alive in, uh, as part of the movement during talk, during what I'm doing. And so the flickering of the saliva and, 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 and like the brilliant, the, the, the glittering color of the teeth will just be part of this very sensory experience when uh, displayed in the uh, mouths of the living. Interesting is also the um, color quality of teeth which will acquire the whitish color of the enamel, but then with age, the enamel kind of gets transparent and lets uh, shine the secondary the teeth through. And the teeth will acquire a yellowish tone, tone which was really identified and tar uh, labeled by ancient um, um, Mesoamericans in their language. And a time when we didn't have whiteness, which we all use. <laughs> um, a note also on the makeup of a tooth. We have the hard enamel, which is the hardest tissue in the human body, and it likes it's even jadeites, I mean really hard, and hard to craft. Below lies the dentine, which in turn involves the pulpar chamber with the nerve canal. Uh, you will have like painful recollection from exactly those uh, dentist visits. And um, the inlays typically are well in the frontal uh, tissue, and we will have time to explore this uh, further on. The Maya had a word for the visible dentition already, uncovered teeth, they call it nichik bal. So um, other terminology is metaphorically so, I mean, so, such a rich language, languages um, in this America are the likening to maize kernels, which can be yellowish or white. Teeth can be, were seen in the uh, cordimax as blade of a saw, and also they were compared to the back of a lizard, uh, alluding um, securely to um, the uh, ongoing crafting, contouring in saw-like fashions of the dentitions when the uh, Iberian conquest happened. Teeth were seen as bones, or they were um, identified as mice, dough colored, like rice, ma rice maize. Sagun dedicated a whole page to the terminology of teeth. It's amazing. Seashells, they can be very colored or black, 
which has to do with the um, practices across subscribed areas uh, in Mesoamerica to color teeth, blacken teeth mostly, or color them with cochineal in different, um, different hoes. Um, that identified ritual occasions, mourning, submersion folk, for example, Veracruz, Totonac, Hidalgo, and sometimes the uh, darkened teeth uh, could even be the basis, the canvas, to hold colorful uh, paints on top. So this is something that we have to look out for. Um, and um, it's something that I don't have the time to go into because this talk is about permanent modifications. Permanent um, modifications have been studied for a long time and hard back, importantly, on the long traditions of Mexican scholarship. You will um, think of Romero. There are some of the fastlet who once was a friend and a dentist of Frida Kahlo, uh, who uh, was Austrian born, and uh, well, he had a passion to close shoulders with uh, Javier Romero, a physical anthropologist of the INA to accrue a huge uh, collection that came in from all states of Mexico and was harbored in physical anthropology at the INA. And then they would go through all the series to see what dental um, modifications they could come across. And this was, of course, part of a greater effort that had a political agenda, not just a scholarly agenda, to kind of map La Gran Mesoamerica that was laid out first by Paul Kirchhoff in the 40s of last century, and then see how this amazingly vibrant uh, match of ethnic groups of today and the past could be encompassed and studied through the lenses of linguistics, archaeology, and of course of physical and dental anthropology. So um, this is just humbling to see the mapping of all these little dots represent little um, dental series that were mapped and uh, explored by Romero and Fastlich for mostly, and then uh, in a taxonomic table, they were scored and they were um, uh, analyzed. And this is all published in a series of lovely um, old school publication, which uh, has um, well brought amazing points of departure for my doctoral thesis, which in, um, in this case, well, led to another project, which is a book pro pro project that is in the oven and which I will present and update here. Another shout out to Guillermo Mata, um, a Guatemaltecan colleague, also a dentist, who has done important footwork in the direction of uh, looking into the instruments, the action procedures that were employed, the materials, and um, which he called Mesoamerican cosmetic dentistry. Lovely work. We had the honor to work with him um, during two decades still. And there's, of course, bioarchaeology. Those of you who are not familiar with the term is the study of human remains from um, a biocultural perspective and as part of the archaeological skeletal record, which in Mesoamerica has its own exception because there we can pull in the ethnohistory, the epigraphy, the iconography, art history, and it's such a rich approach, blend of approaches that uh, permit an emic uh, perspective, a culturally aligned Mesoamerican perspective, which is really hard to attain at this degree in other world cultural spheres. Um, lately, profiling and mapping has become uh, like the um, pars potroto approach, of profiling individuals with the help of polygenomics, isotopic mobility and dietary research. And then there's this flip to, I mean, the, the zooming in and out because bioarchaeology has a very democratic democratic unit of exploration with this human body as materialized in the skeletal uh, skeleton, which is the same um, in terms of social description, gender, age, um, same skeleton we uh, have of the um, king as of the hinterland um, um, commoner and so forth. So this uh, gives like the rich blend and information we need to zoom in and out. Fortunately for us, the ancient Maya buried their dead in the residential uh, districts below their own houses. So we have points of departure to explore residences, families, and localities, exactly with this kind of sort of zooming in and out, which I will practice throughout this talk. Uh, so taking up this uh, emic perspective, 
um, teeth, as we have seen, were entrenched in the back of the lips, and they were common now, like during action, mobility, gestures. Uh, the mouths themselves, where these um, teeth, dental arcades, were anchored, were seen by the ancient Mesoamericans as portal, as little caves that uh, permitted the flux of animated breath and sound and other emanations between the encapsulated living essences and the extrinsic world. Such are identified as kin or exactly for the mouse as sakik al, the enlivened breath. It comes to a surprise, therefore, that human portraiture, such as that of Hanna Pakal, that is so anatomically and aesthetically, um, artistically pleasing, they really do not show much of the dental arcade. And maybe that has to do, as many scholars and my colleagues have pointed out, that um, it was the artistic convention favored the serene, uh, serious look. They wouldn't expect much of an expo uh, uh, emotion or um, open mouth for that sake. Fortunately for us, um, the anthropomorphic imagery of uh, godly advocations of, of gods um, does not cling adhere to this convention. Here we see mouth portals such as those from the Palenque effigy centers that exaggeratingly um, uh, sculpt mouths in forms of animals, in forms of uh, uh, birds in forms of, um, they have fanged incisors, central incisors, they have formal allusions of uh, dis distributing um, dental arcades. So there we have a lot of elements to choose from. This is also true for the imagery uh, of the early Olmecoy figurines that um, are often seen with a central fang and the primordial form um, for enlightened breath or uh, sharp motifs, uh, ink motifs. There's a lot still to be explored. A couple of colleagues from Mexico of mine uh, have used this as a point of departure to try to match far more and beyond. But as mentioned, um, beside the iconography and the imagery, the sculpture, um, those few exceptions um, are the smiling figurines that we know from southern Veracruz that ex do express open house uh, emotion apparently and show their sculpted the dental arcade. Are the real dentitions of the, their human carriers? We have the first ink signs uh, from the Mesoamerican highlands in Platilco, and they shine through also um, uh, through the mouths of early pre class no, middle of the pre classic lowland miners, such as this case, this individual from Seval that looked like this already during the middle of the pre classic. Another form of the central fang, the central motif, is this T shirt shape is the one that has been identified in Teotihuacan and also the Maya area, the Pacific Coast by my colleague as well, the Chinchilla, Kaltau, and many others. It's called the skirted butterfly motif that sometimes hovers below the nose or is also taken up as a motif for egg shapes. We see this um, in the Maya area during the late pre-classic and the early classic. It's described to the high elites, the aristocrats, and of course to Teotihuacan. There is a description of social, um, social elites. We see these only basically in high elite persons, such as the dynasts, early classic dynasts from Tikal, Tsibanchi, uh, Yashuna. It's amazing that this is not like further um, like distributed in the mass of uh, Mayan population. And then during the middle classic, that suddenly shifts. Um, after the fall of Teotihuacan and the mid-classic crisis, then everybody has it. There is no social inscription to it, just as an example. Which leads us to go back to the scoring uh, taxonomy by Javier Romero, because despite um, its benefits to science, there are a lot of shortcomings, of course, that he himself recognized, such as um, like scoring by the tooth, of course. Uh, ancient practitioners didn't have in mind one single tooth to shape. They had in mind the dental arcade, the mouth portal, like this like whole unit. Another um, shortcoming we feel is um, conflating different techniques and different practices, maybe. 
um, by conflating uh, in one table filings, which I would typically call contouring scholarly, with inlays and with tooth engravings inscribing the frontal um, face of the teeth. Um, which were not necessarily one single practice or one single event. We think that um, dental modifications could be performed during the whole uh, life course of an individual. So Romero himself recognized this and he set out um, from the imagery of Mesoamerica to um, well, another table of patterns, which he himself and which he never explored. He passed away in the 80s, like um, fastly. And so we took this up um, as part of my doctoral thesis at first, and then plugging into our database of 4,000 individuals that we could score from our own data sets and from the Romero um, publications of which we have 2,000 that are described by the tooth. And then came up with an updated um, such um, classification of dental arcades, which for A patterns of the incisal edge, B patterns, those like faunal elements, um, uh, advocations that you might have seen in the uh, sensor, um, sensors, effigy sensors, C patterns are the primordial shapes of um, Mesoamerican and North American. Uh, these saw shapes were the first that were practiced. And then again, the E patterns that I call here, that's the eek in their different uh, expressions in the mouths of their human bearers. If we analyze those collectively, then we come up with a peculiar um, proportions I mean, this is just like a screenshot, a snapshot of what we can see in the uh, skeletal and the dental records of those 2,000 individuals. Uh, they match and they, they show continuity, consistency when we score them sidewise. So they are quite conservative, at least, I mean, talking about the contours. And they go beyond the myosphere. They don't uh, match exactly with linguistic groups and not exactly with our own um, um, definition of what is Maya and non-Maya, which they never were, of course. Then when we uh, do this by the region, we come up with similar um, trends, pensions for, like the highlands did not use ick shapes, apparently, according to our records. Then the Mexican highlands are similarly to the western lowlands and so forth. So it gives us a new, vibrant perspective of the enactment of different forms in uh, simultaneous populations, advocations that were in place parallelly, apparently, which is quite exciting. Teeth as canvases were practiced, and there we have uh, apparently a pension that is subscribed to the Maya Lowlands. Um, these hark back on three, four thousand years of history of the past in the Maya Mesoamerican sphere and beyond, and they were enacted as cross-hatched geometric motifs and um, other forms of cutting into land, into the front first surface of incisors for mostly, sometimes combined with filings. Now in the Maya area, and this is really peculiar and surprising, these inscriptions uh, are different from the remainder of Mesoamerica because they have, uh, they hold <coughs> and, and, and show, display, simplified logograms, as we see here, this little ink um, from Oshkin Top that is enhanced still with the uh, butterfly square motif, and then you have these that are, for example, um, for Tikal, and these keep on being practiced um, up until the early classic. In the late pre-classic, 10% of those dental modifications were engraved, really. That's just fascinating, and differently from Mesoamerica. And then they just, the Maya lost interest in it. While it is coming, so it's come back, I think, yeah, it's come back in the Mesoamerican highlands and the post-classics, not taking on again in the Maya area. So there we have something that is more subscribed. This brings us to another facet of this um, fascinating practice, which is the um, crafting of teeth in uh, infant condition and permanent condition as part of uh, youth rituals, as part of everyday life. 
And uh, despite what has been commonly held, there are two very convincing cases of um, inlaying and filing infant teeth, which is only when we plug this into a modified form of our Uber Laker um, tooth dentition development scheme. Um, this is only possible in the second infancy uh, when the first um, teeth just came out. And then they are just pushed away and out, and they uh, they uh, when the permanent dentition erupts. So it's peculiar to see that those well these exemptions. But in the overall uh, score scoring of 167 in the in, in, in dentitions, there was not a single case. Maybe that has its explanation in that well two years afterwards three years the teeth would fall out anyway so it's hard to find really so this brings us to permanent dentitions there is a physiological threshold which is of course um, limited by the eruption of the permanent dentition which happens in third infancy and before teenage age like 10 years eight years 10 years 12 years Interestingly, the Maya and Mesoamericans in general, they started to practice um, at the 20 year threshold, the completion of the first cartoon. We see that, that there is a surge in the percentage of people that have them. We are looking at an anti-mortem pattern, so it doesn't say that a person died at that age. It could live on, the person could live on until old age and still carry the remnants of the permanently inscribed teeth in his or her mouth socket. So so when we look at those very, very um, young uh, tooth set, they subscribe to those dentitions that had been modified, crafted at a very young age. Interestingly, there is this corridor of Chantalpa and the Gulf Coast that um, unites um, sites Chumchukmil, Khaina, Komakalke, and Palenque itself um, that um, harbors individuals of a very young age, surprisingly young age basically suggesting that there's a pure reenactment of those youth rituals, chalk rituals called in Maya, that um, Andrew Scherer would call the um, ritualization of the finished human self. It's when um, um, obligations could be loaded, when it was a full adult, uh, it could enter off, it was a full member of society. So. This um, aspect of the premature enactment also gains visibility when we um, match this record with the known age brackets of rulers or rulers that have been enthroned at a very young age, such as Hanna Pakalov Palenke, a major um, aristocratic player of the 7th century in the uh, lowland Maya kingdoms of the classic period. We know that he reached an age um, up to 80 years, and he was enthroned at the tender age of 13, um, which is what well, pre-teenage. Uh, so when we match his portraiture with his um, study, the study of his real teeth that were entombed um, after death, of course. Um, we revisited his cave to, um, to his, yeah, his mausoleum, his cave void, his, um, his tomb in the uh, late 90s in an interdisciplinary effort to um, update his um, study and, and, an, uh, and, and update also his uh, restoration conservation. And it always struck me, uh, st struck me as odd to see his smallish notches on the lateral part of the central incisors, which stood so much apart from his um, jaded uh, portraiture, his mask, for example, which shows these um, massive ick T-shapes uh, of imbued, uh, enlivened breath that stand, I mean, they, they are much distinct for his, for, from his real embodiment in, in, in life. Um, Teaming up with my uh, dear colleague, Eric Velasquez, we thought, first thought, oh, maybe this was a public speaker. He could not risk a lisp. He needed to pronounce all words right, so he needed to have a healthy, complete uh, dental arcade. So he just emulated something. And then if you look at, I mean, it's all just odd. So let, look at, take a look back at his age. He must have been three teenage when uh, his uh, teeth were crafted as a fin finishing um, procedure before he could um, hold office. 
And when we clean off, this is our project artist, the cinnabar of his <coughs> teeth, we first note, of course, that his teeth were yellowish, which is old age, as we already heard. And then this must have been the look of him when we plug it into like an emulation of his uh, youthful portraiture, how he looked like. And it's quite interesting to see that these smallish notches were quite visible, but also that these smallish notches, um, well, they weren't crafted into denti. We now know if this was hypothetically, but most probably uh, conducted uh, in, in his primary dentition, um, just coming out, the dentine was quite sensitive. So that would have been very painful and put Panapakal in risk uh, to suffer ulterior carogenic um, 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 hollows and carriers, which the practitioner was mostly most wise to, wise to avoid, being very conservative in not hitting the dentine, neither of the lateral incisors nor the central incisors. Um, so this is how he must have looked like, and it's quite impressive to see that his dentition, although it was straightened afterwards, it was polished, I mean, it really sh shone through his shine, was shining through his mouth, if they never touched it again. And probably the healthy dentition of a ruler was something that was very important. It's a waste, of course, scrutiny further on. Oh my God, I'm running on low battery power. I think I will defer to Mario. This is probably because it's being, um, um, being displayed to the screen. So um, I don't have the time to go into this. Uh, except for saying that there was a breadth of um, daily treatments that went on all um, all um, through adult life in the form form of shining polishes, um, leaving tartar on, making tartar a part of um, the exhibit of teeth, um, using tooth floss, etc. So there's this life cycle of teeth that we can see and again plug in uh, like an adapted form of the Uberlaker format that have their uh, cycles until they were fine to the roots or fall, fall, fell out. So how do we know from the bioarchaeological record that this was ongoing during the whole lifespan? We have a distinctive match in all uh, adult um, groups, uh, age ranges, of maybe a 10% of um, fresh filings that will, with mastication, with wear and tear, just fade away, become remnant. Does this work? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, remnant and then just fade away. So when we match this up with our age and death profiles, we see a constant match which makes us believe that these were constant practices. Uh, sometimes the practitioners would shape, um, change the shape, the pattern, the visual pattern. And this uh, enabled us also, was enabled also, okay, we have the next one, to go deep into the tooth because um, the post-traumatic uh, physiological reaction of the dentine uh, led to the calcification of the pulpar chamber and then to make the canvas of the tooth deeper and they could uh, like cover more volume to go deeper into the tooth or even fill tooth sockets like in our example to the right. So here's the a statistic of all of that by my colleague um, um, Ramirez, um, Marco Ramirez did his doctoral thesis on this um, um, cycling of inlays, which is much more complex, and it shows everything that go wrong and was uh, achieved by the ancient Maya dentitioners. He showed basically how the life cycle went on. So they would encrust firstly, and then from there um, they would file down, but eventually the, the tooth fissured, then it would break into the void, the inlay would fall out, and they, again they filed up to the stump. And so you have this life cycling of inlays. Um, I don't have the time to go into the exact procedures, but we infer them typically from um, experiments and on their final result in the um, hollow uh, drilled tooth sockets. 
where we that can be straight widening this it was a, a like a four step approach with an initial then they carved out and they had to accommodate the hollow and then the cement was put in we now know that the cements had antifungal uh, anti-inflammatory they had sealing properties that went surely beyond our modern quarter cement or came close to it given the ex enormous i mean the astounding success rate right, of inlays in the mouths of their living um, carriers um, also different forms and shapes speak to the sensory quality and the emblematic uh, um, expression of different colors the embodiment of different colors green stones blackish stones these again were most probably not enacted or in many cases we don't know really because also Drilled stones were, say, my precious, so they were taken out, they could fall out, they were stolen. So this is like a, like a, a dental anthropologist nightmare, really, to the more percentages, I must say. Um, and Cher has uh, recorded for Piedras Negras, other sites, I mean, these extreme forms that are something, sometimes asymmetric, sometimes different colors are matched, it's just like amazing. Also, these approaches to the materiality that are often surprising, and they bring home the point that everything you see, or much of what you see is not really what was there. Our definition of jade being yellow doesn't really uh, coincide with the special study that have been contacted as part of our Conacid project that turn out to be muscovite or parrots that are differently shaded, serpentines that are greenish. It's just very astounding and I think it still abates um, systematic scrutiny. Just as the, um, the one um, that we um, have examined together with our colleagues from Brown University and the Peabody Museum in terms of the sealants. And it came to, not to a surprise, but it was impressive to see that they would, uh, after the inlay had fallen out, then fill it back again and color the resins they use or the tar to make them extremely colorful. This brings me to the last part of this talk that is jewel teeth across the early Mesoamerican color steps and beyond. When we um, take a step back and look at those um, inlaid dental arcades, we have many questions concerning their origins. And these are beyond the Maya sphere. We can see them in Western Mexico. And then these are all pre-classic across the Mesoamerican landscapes. We have them in Chalchualpan, Reynosa, Cerro de las Mesas. So this is really Montenegro, pan-Mesoamerican phenomenon. And it talks again uh, about the high mobility rate, at least among the elites, who are more linked to this form of dental embodiment than the contouring and other practices. And of course, the Maya area. And when we look at um, the um, distribution uh, across the Mesoamerican color states, again, um, during the classic, we see of course, this has to do that Maya archaeology is one world cup, so there have been a lot of excavations. Uh, but yeah, we see they're absolutely centered and uh, in the northern part and more so in the lowlands, not so much in the highlands. We will come to that in a minute. So jewel teeth and Maya color scapes again. Uh, escape, and I will take off this little synopsis that which, which I ended last year for head shaping. And they are gendered, but not exclusively. There's a pension among males, but not exclusively. Then the, we're talking about the classic period because that was something that was then uh, obliterated from um, the cultural repertoire of the Maya, at least. Um, there's social differentiation, yes, of course. Every third uh, elite male uh, showed them. Um, social ages and agency becomes important most probably because the shifts, we cannot follow them through um, the uh, linguistic divides. It's, it's kind of elusive. So there's probably something that is less conservative, less ethnically inscribed, less permanent in inlaid teeth. 
more trendy. Language groups and dental work do not kind of match or work out. Showing versus hiding becomes very important in those, which is something like we have seen is not necessarily Maya or um, conservative. One of the um, privileged glimpses we have, like comparing areas, is um, the Atlas project. Uh, here's my colleague Edgar Cardio. Um, he's not from the Atlas project, but I'm thankful you could join. Um, we have made uh, Guatemala a close project, um, collaborating equal partners in also this um, this collaboration. Uh, this ha has been a happy um, closing shoulder since the 90s with Juan Pedro Laporte, whose vision and mission uh, was not going into the site course, but working in the peripheries of site. And he really got into getting to know um, the real population that lived there, not just the elite. And so when we um, apply this and, and sort this out for dental works, dental crafting, what we see is a peculiar, very peculiar picture that makes sense. Commoners would do it, yes. Two thirds of the adult population show dental crafting in the forms of shiny polishes and different contours. Everybody would do it. Um, not so much inlays, there are very few cases. And then there's continuity with the collapse uh, and with the kind of the lack, the drop in the visible, ostentatious. Uh, expression of, of dental work. They just keep on doing it during the terminal classic until the very end of the occupational sequences. So it's, it's really a telltale game, game changer looking at these uh, and sharing and, and learning through uh, with, with our colleagues um, these, these, these insights. Quite different from what we just saw uh, in the Paten, even the Paten, are the expressions of jewel teeth on the Maya borderlands. And here, this ostentatious aspect becomes very important, apparently. Important work at Cambuen by my colleague Claudia Quintanilla shows like this, this amazing, uh, like the, 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 the efforts Maya's went in, in inlaying uh, the upper arcade, the lower arcade, um, also the Copan Valley. Uh, which was a multi-ethnic uh, area uh, of 20 kilometers where the core population was most probably Maya, mostly Maya, but the Lenko population. The Lenko populations in the uh, outskirts of Copan, in those, uh, like uh, the satellite sites in the Copan Poya, are the ones that show this practice the most gaudy, the most like uh, visibly, uh, as you saw these like fungus uh, shapes, they just covered their teeth. And they did so and filed constantly. It was like big time. Um, which brings us to um, distinguishing or comparing matching dental works with um, head shapes. And this, in, in fact, has a relevance. And now we can answer this question that I posed a year ago. When we match dental works, the inlays at least, with different head shapes, the only head type that, that is correlated positively are top flattened heads. These are the heads that were hallmarks, physical embodiments, as we have proposed in prior work of merchant folks and multi-ethnic, well, uh, coastal settlers that uh, begin to become quite visible in the uh, skeletal record and also in the iconography across the coastal fringes and also through the Ismic Pacific and deep down into Central America, down to Panama, and they're there. So um, interestingly, these are the, one that are the ones that are, um, and that's statistically relevant, these were the ones that are show the most lavish um, dental works in forms of inlays, during the classic at least. You may say, well, it's just another uh, variety of head shaving. No, it is not. Um, still described and still seen are the head shapers that are very peculiar. They had to fix the, the mandible of the um, infant with head benders to the bottom. They had to fix the body inside. There were hammocks described for Central American uh, apparatuses of, that would uh, give way to these forms. It's like put a plate on top of a head and these were uh, like highlighted or they were hidden below these broad brimmed heads and they're quite visible. So we have them in toy course inlay of uh, individuals from Chiapa de Corso, we have them from jaded inlays 
um, individuals from Haina and other sites. So there is something. But interestingly, this um, matching gets lost during the post classic as inlaying is no longer practiced. When we go across the inland Maya hubs of before, we cannot come across um, inlays anymore. Only sites that border sites as La Canton Chapal, which are really highland, and if they, they, they are and the, on the thresholds of these broad merchant corridors of the highlands that were um, instrumented uh, at last by the Aztecs or coastal sites, and then further down towards Colombia, even Peru, although this is not published, uh, Ecuador, these were images that are still being shown and um, use different um, materials such as gold. They're no longer, um, there's a, a, a black, black hole. What happened in the inlands was different. It, um, after the Maya collapse, um, the Maya women's and males and females went back to their ancestral um, ways of contouring their teeth that we have seen, the saw-shaped teeth, um, that hark back on 3,000 years of history. It's very interesting to see this so um, uh, explicitly in this cranium record and also uh, referred to um, still by Flavio de Landa. Um, inlays were no longer practiced in these areas, mostly by women and mostly enacted on women. So I will close with this also for time reasons um, with the citation of the Coco Wu, and here I don't have the time to go through the whole citation, which is just lovely because it gives like a direct glimpse into one of the reasons, probable reasons of why uh, the glittery um, dental embodiment got lost, and it it. Um, it basically is the epiphany, um, seven markers, this colorful bird that's being killed by the hero uh, twins, uh, is the epiphany of the old um, divine, uh, like kingdoms of um, rulers that were like the divine gods and who were emblemished that, that by, by, by not having the power, real power as conferred by the gods and who were like, ostentatious and presumptuous, just as seven mock-up. He says, my teeth as well are jade stones. He still refers to this ancient practice as the face of the sky. And so this um, sequence ends by um, the, this wonderful poetry phrase of, thus the basis of his pride was completely taken away. It was, he was tricked, his, his teeth were knocked out and he was killed. They had, the Kiro gems had desired the death of Methan, seven Makal, and they were able to do it, for they saw pride as evil and went to do these things according to the world of heart of sky. They were enabled by the gods. So this would give a glimpse into the motif of a faint era being just obliterated and replaced by a new era of new respect to the gods and new advocations. I will. Um, close in this vein by many acknowledging comments also to my hosts and a big big thank you Jos Boutique. <laughs>
basis for scientific. Well, um, I, unfortunately, I had to condense uh, much, much information into this talk. That would be a talk entirely um, like apart. Um, I could just, yeah, uh, if, like let you know that 50% um, of the women keep on practicing a dental contouring at the time of contact during the late post-classic period in the Maya area, while the males kind of drop. Formerly they had um, inlaid their teeth too, but then 20% is the rate of male inlay. So it's for mostly female practice. And then when we plug into this, um, the testimonies, mainly Landa, unfortunately, there's not much, um, although yes, there are. Um, they talk of old women doing this, going about this practice. So yes, but I think um, this all awaits a lot of, lot of exploration still which we have just, I think, started to unfold. And much of this has to do with the advocations, the pantheon of the gods and advocations that um, have to do with the individual, um, its day of birth, with uh, the fate of the individuals, something that we're just tapping into and we don't know how this shuffled out in terms of the decision, the agency, because there was agency involved in um, Forming, I mean, in, in contouring the two, two lines, straightening it out, or yes, doing it or not, and in which shape. So there's much to do so. I don't know that I have. I mean, this is maybe a ridiculous part. I don't know what these questions might make any sense or not, but like, so did each person sort of pay for their own inlays? You know what I mean? Did each person kind of pay for their own inlays? Were you like, I really want. You know, some turquoise all in here, or, or, what, or was it like done to people as kind of like this is your station? Who, I mean, it must have been, it seems like very expensive work. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. That's unfortunate. We don't know. We have these indirect insights, but then when it comes to, there has been wonderful work by George Schnell and um, Andrew Scherer on fractured teeth and um, pulling out teeth uh, and like doing this in the marketplaces of Piedras Negras. And I thought this was like a fresh insight on the places where these dental practitioners worked, most probably artisans and well, highly esteemed by their community, uh, knowledgeable in therapeutics and in like the uh, herbal um, treatments and so forth. I mean, these were medical doctors and surgeons and like, but it's also um, challenging. Mm -hmm. Because there are no direct sources, more for mostly talking about this being uh, 500 years before um, the contact. contact. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Rachel. I'm a student in the technology department, the graduate program. Um, and really, I have so many questions, and some of them are a little bit outlandish, so I can um, save those. Later, <laughs> I can send you an email maybe. But I'm currently interested, in, and I've been thinking a lot about uh, um, the kind of sonora, like the, I, the connection between breath and music, and kind of the role that these uh, individuals might have had. And I think well, I think this project is so cool because you're looking at it from this like very kind of like a local lens, maybe the what's happening in each city and who like who are the figures that have these because these were very important people right and in, in, in oh. the, the mm -hmm. oh no and well, with certain sorry with certain uh, uh certain modifications maybe there are some that were exclusive to certain uh peoples and societies and like why uh why might like someone's uh sculpture uh have a certain inlay versus that not being in. That's a fascinating um, yes, um, perspective in, indeed, which is still being explored and being explored already by my colleagues. I just wanted to single out the work by uh, Andrew Feingold, uh, Claudia Brittenham. I mean, uh, the, 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 the experience, the sensory experience, and the act of doing, and the feeling, and the multi, I mean, the multi-sensory um, expressions of sound, and like feeling um, the sound and the breath going through your teeth. I mean, that's something that is very, very Mesoamerican. Um, and to find both work on drilling, for example, as consumption, on eating, 
um, holds and that, that speaks to this topic. It's the physical embodiment, it's the human side the experience of culture, society, and worldview. So yes, of course, it's very relevant. And music is just another facet of this. Sorry, it feels like some of these dental modifications would change speech patterns too. Right. And I wonder if you've done any modeling about that. That's a very, very good question. Yes, you're, you're referring to the lisp and uh, the inability, uh, incapability to pronounce certain, um, all vocals but not consonants, certain consonants that have been identified in Maya, glottal sounds, so it's, it's kind of tricky. But um, yes, this would be the up double E shape that you see in the smiling figurines from Veracruz. I mean, they could not have used their dentition the same way as an unshaped individual. I mean, I refer to the double T shape. It's obviously something that is um, um, metaphorically um, represented in the architecture in the mouth portals in Palenque, this is Palenque, and there are the upper, the lower T-shapes, and that's something very important. I have asked myself on a very personal, and we see them in Copan, we see them, were these the slaves who would not speak, or were these the musicians who would just, I mean, use their mouth a different way? I think these are all fascinating avenues to explore, and now that we have like the physiology and like the bioarchaeology of how it was really done and how like the anatomy of it I think we're in the position to go about it in a more um, like um, scientifically sound way it's not just um, I mean hermeneutical if this is a dialogue that is materialized or held up by by a record mm -hmm. The question, I'm a visiting student in anthropology as well and working in lowland South America. So my oh, point, uh, work, I'm working in Amazonia. Mm -hmm. And so my point of comparison would be like um, the, the teeth work among the Jivaro, which is very, very famous. And in that case, many teeth would be shaped like uh, to um, be similar to Jaguar with a um, predatory motivation. But also, they would need to be concealed, like in normal life, like while eating, things like that. So I was wondering if um, related also to the Popol Vuh, the fact that uh, teeth would be um, a sign of power, uh, a clear sign of power, and the fact that in some representations like statues, teeth would not be represented, especially in human, would that be related like to like um, the fact that being polite could be related also to uh, not showing the teeth and uh, all the modifi modification uh, too uh, directly? Uh, I was just wondering. <laughs> I think there's a wonderful analogy that we have in Mesoamerica or beyond, which is the wrapping, the hiding, showing, the wrapping of sacred um, relics, the wrapping of catches, they're hidden, they're involved, they're open. And I, I, I think there is an analogy there. Um, it, it's the performing um, vocal voids, performing uh, mouths, and having the, she the part of this performance would be the dental arch, which is hidden. And then when the person speaks, it, it shines exactly. something mm -hmm. really fascinating to, to imagine. I mean, there's a person that is silent, you wouldn't see. Uh, the emblematic contour he or she were, uh, but then when the person spoke up or sang or um, uh, prayer, prayed, we would see it, would be part of the uh, uh, filtered, purified, I was just talking in class about that, the purified breath that would be even more filtered by, by this action, and I think there's a lot of parallels with with Chicago, with, with your your example from Southern America. I don't know how this echoes with your embracing. I don't know, it's very interesting because then it's very hard to make like um, um, like um, precise comparison, like what you were saying about breath and the poison of breath um, issuing the mouth 
uh, related to power, to vitality, etc. is a very common um, a common theme in lowland South America as well. So that's also a way to um, address question of similarity of um, exchange between between lowland and uh, Maya or Inca civilization, which is very interesting. But still, there is a lot of work to be done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. And I have questions that uh, relate to the ones that were just asked. Uh, one on the visibility and hiding and, and making visible. Um, it does seem that visibility would be a, a, a you know consideration, though, because they're not modifying the molar, as you said, right? Or, 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 or are there modifications to the backs of teeth so that there's a you know, in the of the precious stone, but that's not outward facing. There are two or three dubious cases, which I would not refer to because they are dubious. There has been so much falsification, unfortunately. So you really have to make sure that these are real. But yeah, the motif is, is clearly the. I think there are two or three, or well, maybe, but well, very few cases of the second premolar, they all subscribe to um, for the anterior dentition. Right, so that's not doing any of this extra work where it would, it would be wasted and not be uh, visual, visibly accessible in some regard. No. 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 There, there is loss. I mean, you can see a lot of treatments and, and like enhancement protection also in the back of the jaw. But the anterior dentition is like the most, most cared for, I would say. And then the second question related to this sort of sharing of or similar practice in our places like Amazonia. Um, so you talked about the widespreadness across Mesoamerica. This is a pan Mesoamerican practice, not limited to the Maya. So I was wondering what kind of evidence there is going the other direction down into Central America. Do we see? Inlays, we see similar uh, dental modifications going on in that direction. Um, interestingly, uh, what well, maybe a cautionary note: what we see are the big centers mainly. It's because these have been excavated more than little smallish communities, and so we're not quite sure how this all kind of distributes, um, like down the social strata. Um, but. Yeah, it's at least region-wise, it's, it's very much widespread. And then in Central America, it's, it's amazing to see that uh, the Chorotega, and, I mean, they take up much of the head shaping um, traditions and also the filings. There are a couple of, um, again, um, like sources on inlays too, um, which we have mostly further south, south of Panama for Ecuador. Uh, that continue on with drillings. Um, and this is ongoing work, by, lovely work by my colleague Jungs and colleagues in the growth group. I, I'm just now entering and, and we're kind of, wow, it's, it's very widespread. Mm -hmm. So um, just to wrap this up, I was fascinated uh, because I did my own digging to see, um, thanks to my colleague in Costa Rica, um, uh, she told me that um, dental contouring is still practiced by not just the A-type. And you can see it, that these uh, are smallish communities on the uh, Atlantic coast. And then even top flattened hats were still sported by the beginning of last century. And I have the old photos who said this cannot be. They have this triangular um, like shapes and that clearly still. So I think uh, what we see are the remnants of long, long, like dynamics of population flows, and of course, uh, cultural transmissions are very, very complex. But it's amazing to see them still. Is there any like? Uh, do you think the connections between? Uh, uh, I like, I'm thinking of like the stones and the, like the metaphor of having a stone in the mouth and like certain people who have stones in their mouths post like after they die. Um, but I, I, I'm just thinking about the iconography that you're looking at. I think there are two aspects that I've been really uh, fascinated about. 
is that the stone is semi-precious. So basically, if you consume, you enter, you drill, you're entering, uh, in this metaphor, the sacred mountain, you're entering the body, you're cutting it open, you, you, you liberate those energies, pain, whatever you want to call them, the, um, and then you plug with the semi-precious stone this energy into the tooth. So you're basically kind of um, sealing it. Can I have a I just think about my mom told me a story once where she like had a friend in like the place where she was growing up and she fell and her teeth were like pressed up into her gums and the like kids on the street would talk about how she was like never the same again, uh, like behaviorally. Not I don't think it was like an outward like brain trauma, but I was just thinking about the connections between the like nerve tissues and the, even like the experience of a pain, I think is really interesting. How I mean, here I think I, I, it would be wise to stop. Yeah. Uh, and as a cautionary remark, I would say it's wonderful to have all these ideas, but then you absolutely need to um, ingrain them with evidence. I, I, I'm very hesitant to elaborate if there's not like different lines, perspective that kind of yeah, show that this was really so because then you kind of detach yourself from historical reality and then you kind of yeah you look great about something and then you kind of twin you twizzle out of um, like um, living reality. And then bioarchaeology is wonderful as a reality check and it pulls you back to what was and what was not. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay, I see yeah, there's another oh um you mentioned that most of the inlays were with semi-precious stones. Were there instances that you came across where it was maybe like an imitation of like I using? Can hear now, so. Oh, I can I can take <laughs> my mask off. Um, you mentioned that most of the inlays were using semi-precious stones. Did you come across any instances where um, it may have been like imitated by sort of a lower class using non-semi-precious stones? Exactly, and that, that's the slide I showed. Um, Typically, you do have jaded, but jaded is not jade, as you know, is not only green, it can come in black, it can come in white, it can come in really all colors. So, and now doing all the material analysis systematically on like samples, uh, we had our um, like surprise uh, surprises. Mm -hmm. So, I think they were absolutely aware about um, the materiality of what they were crafting, fitting, and um, kind of shaping. So, because of the hardness, jadeite is, is, is hardly equal by other materials because it's so hard. Uh, but the emulation of the color with others, I think I mentioned Mukabai, Serpentine, yeah, it, 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 it happened. I mean, we have no, since this is very, very specific, punctual, these material studies, we don't have any um, regional coverage or survey of who would perform or use for which color, which sort of material. But that's absolutely an avenue to be um, followed up. <laughs> yes. Yes, Claudia. I wonder if. Like we still see dental modification in the modern world today, right? I mean, and it's mostly, you know, I mean, much more sort of like old worlds around teeth than it is um, these, these practices of filing or inlaying. But, you know, I just wonder if there's anything, you know, if there are any kinds of connections that you think about between those traditions and. Yes. Good point, good point, yeah. This was my acquaintance in Pop Tun, and he, I, I asked him, could I take a picture just the, and he said, okay. And I, I of course, I had to um, bombard him with questions as to why and how, and um, I'm hesitant to kind of describe a profound historical tradition to this, because everything now is feasible with modern dentistry, so, I think yes and no. I, I just cannot make the connection because it was lost for so long. And exactly in vain, kind of, it was no longer practiced after uh, the thousand year threshold in the area. So I'm quite hesitant to, yeah, that, that would be my, my point. But it's, yeah, the, the, the motif and the, like, the visible impact is still there, of course. Mm -hmm.
I don't know. I don't think it's very much no, it's, it's so satisfactory to <laughs> reply to you. No, it's, I mean, but it's hard to think across the, that, you know, thousand year goal. Like, also, it's sort of exciting to be able to talk to people who have, you know, chosen that modification and hear why. And, you know, not that it, you know, not that you can import that back a thousand years, but yeah. And then the, the interesting thing is that um, my colleague uh, Guillermo Mata uh, did exactly that. Um, but then Latinos would do it exactly the same. And then he, but it was just like a rural thing to do. And in the end, I think, I mean, if there would be a point of departure of like looking at a certain, at the Kekchi or at the Cho or Yucatec. Probably there would be something, but I'm still hesitant if that would make sense, apart from doing ethnology or anthropology. Well, well, thank you so much, Vera. This has just been fascinating. And, uh, do you want to come here? <laughs> Good, but I, 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 I feel. Yes. yes so, so thank you so much, Vera. This was just just a fascinating look at a series of ancient practices that give us both a sense of kind of material and embodied realities, but then also of the sort of larger set of constellation of beliefs about bodies in the universe that are behind them. And I think we'll all feel a little bit differently for our next dentist visit. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so very much. Um, and I'll just say Vera is here for another um, however run many more weeks we got in this quarter. And so um, you know, please take advantage of her time here as you can. And anyway, thank you so much for this wonderful walk.